So I'll bring up another case. Um, and this is a 15 uh, year old female at her high school screening. She had uh, scoliosis. Um, she had kind of these vague history of headaches and back pain. And so her MRI, uh, her PCP ordered an MRI. And here was her MRI. And it's the same sort of thing that we were seeing. Um, you know, this herniation of the cerebellar tonsils, there's a syrinx in her cervical spine, you can see kind of a little bit of abnormality and just the general alignment of her neck. Um, so the remainder of her imaging was unremarkable except some scoliosis. So she was treated, she standard Chiari treatment, a suboccipital decompression, SC1 laminectomy, a duroplasty, uh, the tonsils were shrunk. Um, and this was all done uh, before I came to know her. And she did great for three months. And then all of a sudden, she started having some left-sided neck pain. She had a new onset tachycardia and was having these intermittent uh, palpitations. Uh, she was having some dizzy spells, lightheadedness. Um, she was diagnosed with POTS. For those of you that have not uh, yet done a, a PEDS rotation, this is basically just like lightheadedness in, in a teenage population. Um, and then she had the onset of these frequent hiccups and she would have several episodes of hiccups that would last for hours um, and frequently would end up in the emergency room because she couldn't get them to stop. So she got another MRI and her syrinx was gone and you can see she's well decompressed. Um, she had a Cine flow study. There was great flow both in front of and behind the, uh, the cord at the frame and magnum. Um, and so this in all, you know, in all of the things that we think about, this is somebody who, who had a very successful surgery. Everything looks great. Radiographically, she looks fantastic, but she's got all of these symptoms. Um, so, so this was kind of way back. Um, this was, you know, the original thought of there's, there's, there's something that we're missing. Um, and this was done. There were 40 pediatric patients and they had, a all were noted to have a retroflexion of their dens. Um, and this is a PBC2 line. So this is one of the measurements that we do in Chiari's. And all of them were over nine millimeters. And these kids, um, after Chiari decompression, were these kids that ended up needing craniocervical fusions. Um, so occipital cervical fusions. And so this really led us to an identification of another category of Chiari. And so this is where we get into complex Chiari malformations. So we have a lot of things um, and a lot of, of findings that will throw somebody into this category. Um, and that's that Chiari 1.5 malformation. Uh, if they have kind of a medullary kink, um, so their, their kind of medulla is kinked over their, their anterior skull base. Um, we do know that uh, syrinx and scoliosis contribute uh, if they have any sort of basal or invagination, that retroflexion of the odontoid process, if they have any abnormalities of their clavicle cervical angle, um, the occipitalization of the atlas and, and these other craniovertebral junction abnormalities. So these all kind of fell into this complex Chiari malformation group. And so we need a little bit of a refresher or uh, an introduction to uh, basal or invagination if you've uh, not yet had uh, education on this. Um, but there's kind of three main things, uh, three ways that we think about that. And, and ultimately underlying this is what we think is the pathology in this is that the release uh, in surgery of this posterior tension band, it causes either progressive, progressive craniocervical settling, um, progression of basilar, basilar invagination, or just um, you know a, a small amount of instability in the sort of micro motion that, that puts these patients at risk for developing um, craniocervical junction instability after a decompression. So what's next for our patient? Um, so she, of course, went to neurology because they weren't sure what was going on. They got a 24-hour EEG. They were wondering if she had some weird sort of vagal nerve compression um, that was causing. Um, and then uh, they got us involved. And, and the only thing that was notable on her exam was just this sort of frequent episodes of hiccups. Um, so she got the gamut of everything, you know, again, with the onset of neck pain and all of these ventral brainstem signs that she was having, it, my concern was that she had developed this craniocervical instability. Um, so I got flexion extension x-ray, she got a CT of her C-spine, she got flexion extension MRI to take a look at everything. 
Um, and why did I put her through all of that? Well, when we think about it, there's kind of this slew of symptoms that should cue you into the possibility that after Chiari decompression, any of these new symptoms could mean that somebody has developed um, uh, basically occipital cervical instability. Um, so recurrence of their occipital headache, um, in particular neck pain, uh, if they develop new myelopathy or hyperreflexia, if they have any sort of posterior column dysfunction, if they have a downbeating nystagmus or change in their gag reflex or dysphagia. Um, so all of these kind of, all of those bulbar signs that were occurring before, if these are new following decompression, you have to be a little bit concerned, um, especially in the setting of a patient who had complete resolution of her syrinx and adequate CSF space around her cord. So those parameters that we talked about, uh, so McRae's line, if you draw a line at the skull base, the dens should not extend above it. So this is a sort of yes or no, uh, does or it does not uh, criteria for basal invagination. And then the, the two parameters that we use predominantly in these complex Chiaris, the PBC2 line um, is a line drawn from the tip of the tip of the basion down to the posterior aspect of C2. Uh, and then it's a measurement, a perpendicular measurement from that line to the point of maximum uh, posterior extent of the dens. Um, this is typically done, you can see in this, this is done on MRI rather than CT um, because you also want to capture any of that kind of soft tissue that's within that, within that measurement. Um, so if you do have patients that have a little bit of instability, they can develop kind of hypertrophy of the soft tissues or a panis, and you want to make sure that you're including that within that measurement. Uh, and then the clavial axial angle, if you take the uh, line drawn parallel to the bottom two thirds of the clavus, uh, and then a line, a line uh, that's drawn parallel to the posterior aspect of um, the dens, uh, it's that angulation between that measurement. So this was kind of her flexion extension. Um, and you can see when, when she extended, it's not a ton. Um, her ADI didn't really change that much. That's that 2.2 and 2.3 millimeter. But you can see kind of how much she's, she's kind of moving at that. And to some degree, we think that there's some motion that's normal there. Um, but with this in kind of this entire setting, and if you look, this, this left picture is actually her in, in neutral and fairly, um, fairly uh, kinked over. Um, so she was someone that I put in a, a, a hard collar or a cervical collar um, just to see if I could give her a little bit of extra um, support. And then if she didn't have any resolution in her symptoms, I was going to try her on cervical traction to see if that could stop her hiccups. Um, but after about a week and a half in the collar, um, her hiccups completely went away. Um, so that sort of gave me the answer. Um, and so, you know, then you have to have this talk with them of, I think we're, we're heading in the direction of an occipital cervical fusion. Um, but now we've done, uh, thanks to the group at Utah, we have a ton of information um, that really gives us a better idea of who's at, who's at risk for this. Um, so in their group, they looked at 101 different patients with Chiaris and 19 of them required uh, an OC fusion. Um, and the indications were anything from bulbar symptoms, myelopathy, um, either an unresolving or progressive syrinx. So that was kind of how we first developed this. This hiccup case was a sort of weird one, um, but we do have a subset of patients that their syrinx actually gets worse after decompression. And, and those are the ones that we consider. Um, or if they had any sort of prior transoral odontodectomy. Um, and so <laughs> there were some patients in their study that met their criteria kind of before the decompression, and they just ended up getting the, the suboccipital decompression and a concurrent fusion. Um, but patients that were meeting criteria after decompression had a delayed fusion. So in their study, they were really looking at, you know, this, this PBC2 line, uh, and the clavicle axial angle. And so they were trying to decide, um, you know, where are these cutoffs that, that we worry about where somebody is going to be at a higher risk? Um, and their cutoff on the PBC2 line was nine millimeters, and their clavicle axial angle was 125 degrees. Um, 
And so, you know, they were also looking at kind of this need for delayed fusion, um, more likely in Chiari 1.5s, more likely with that medullary kink, uh, more likely in patients that had basilar invagination, um, and then the, the PBC2 and clavulaxial angle. So this is sort of their, um, their management algorithm. Um, if they do have that complex Chiari, they look at the PBC2 line. If it's if it's less than nine, uh, then they fall into a generally lower risk group, although not zero. Um, if that PBC2 is greater than nine uh, and that clival axial angle is less than 125, so that really sort of flattened um, platabasia, um, those are the kids that have the highest risk of fusion. They had like an 83.3% fusion rate. Um, so those are the ones that were really the, the highest risk. Um, and it doesn't always over time, you realize we don't always have to do address anything from the front. Usually um, stabilizing them from the back uh, is sufficient and they don't necessarily need a transoral odontoidectomy um, in their cohort. They did have some that, that had the odontoid reduction as well um, if they had persistent symptoms following uh, the fusion. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.